but more than anything else, we'll be talking about American foreign policy tonight, which somehow or other we always seem to get back to because that's the dominant issue of the day. Our government is fiddling around in this world, creating conditions that can only be described as explosive. This evening, uh, just after dinner, I saw the start of a CNN one-hour special on nuclear terror and how easy it would be to smuggle in a nuclear bomb into America, blow up an American city, and as one of the observers on the show said, make 9-11 look like a mere toothache. And, of course, the implication is obvious. It is so easy to get a nuclear bomb in the United States that we really only have two choices. Either we just give up and let the terrorists come in and blow up American cities and kill hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Americans, or door number two is we really beef up what can only be called police state security. And that means inspecting every single container coming into an American port from top to bottom, which would, of course, bring trade to a standstill. Foreign trade would just come right to a screeching halt. And all the things that we rely on from people around the world, uh, we would not be able to get for very long because they would stop sending it under those circumstances. And, of course, any individual coming into the country would have to be searched from top to bottom, probably strip searched, cavity searched, uh, all of his belongings searched, all of his suitcases, everything. And who knows what else uh, would be the powers that would be demanded by the government in order to stop this. So we are faced with only two possibilities, submit to nuclear terror or submit to police state security. And, of course, door number three is never mentioned in these discussions. And I must say, first of all, that I can't swear to it that it wasn't mentioned in the CNN broadcast because I wasn't able to stay and watch the entire hour. But I have not seen one of those broadcasts yet that brought up door number three, which is change American foreign policy so that terrorists would not want to attack America, so that ter terrorists would no longer have any reason to attack America. They don't have programs like that in Switzerland. They don't have programs like that in Sweden. They don't have programs like that in most of the countries of the world because those countries are not meddling in the affairs of other countries and creating all kinds of resentment around the world. And a foretaste of what we are in for in America can be seen by what's going on in Russia right now. The Russian military under the direction of Vladimir Putin, and you may remember years ago in 2001 when George Bush met with Vladimir Putin and he said, I could look into his soul and I saw a good man. Uh, words to that effect, I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact words, but that look into his soul business has been etched in my memory. And Vladimir Putin directing the Russian military has been brutal positively brutal in putting down the independence movement in Chechnya. And Chechnya, of course, is a part of Russia. It was not a separate republic in the Soviet Union like the Ukraine and um, Turkmenistan and a bunch of these other ones that have since broken off and been separate countries. So the Russian government says we have a reason to put down this independence because it would be like the state of Louisiana deciding it wanted to secede from the Union. Uh, Bush would have no choice but to put down an independence movement even though there is nothing in the Constitution that prevents or prohibits a state from seceding from the Union. But anyway, uh, the important point to realize is that Chechnya was not always a part of Russia. Russia was never, uh, pardon me, uh, Russia at one time, hundreds of years ago, was not nearly as big as it is today, but it acquired this great landmass by scooping up countries around it and uh, just simply uh, dominating them and taking them over and incorporating them into Russia. And then, of course, when the Soviet Union came along, in 1917, they even took on more countries and made them part of, of the Soviet Union. But the point is that it is that brutality that has caused the Chechnyans to respond in a terrorist fashion. Now, obviously, I do not condone the blowing up of a school in Russia. I do not condone the suicide bombers. I do not condone putting poison gas or bombs on trains. I don't condone anything like that because that's violence. And I'm opposed to violence in all its forms and on all its sides. But the point is that these terrorists are doing what they are doing in Russia simply because of the police state tactics that the, the Russian government is using. And, of course, the answer to those terrorist tactics is more police state methods, and that's why Vladimir Putin in this last week has taken on more authoritarian powers to himself. The governors of the provinces will no longer be elected by the people. They will be appointed by the new Tsar of Russia, who is Tsar Vladimir and, of course, it is all presented to the Russian people on the basis of you only have two choices. Either we adopt these police state tactics or we continue to be beset by terrorists. And, of course, that's what we're heading for in the United States. I say heading for it. We're not really heading for it. We're in the middle of it. We have already seen what happens when you try to get onto a, an airliner. We've already seen that Congress just rolls over and plays dead for the president. There 
are so many things that John Kerry could talk about, so many things that he could capitalize in this campaign if he wasn't such a blithering idiot, if he had any sense whatsoever. He could make foreign policy an issue. He could talk about bringing the troops home, which is what 90% of the American people want. They are afraid, however, that if they do, something terrible is going to happen because Bush has implied that. But all it would take would be a few sentences from Kerry to point out that that isn't the case and that, in fact, what we ought to do is to withdraw from all these affairs around the world that are creating such terror for United States citizens. But, of course, John Kerry isn't that smart, and probably down deep inside he's looking forward to being president and having the kind of power, the kind of authority, the kind of masculine uh, dominance that George Bush has acquired over the world. And so John Kerry is perhaps hoping he can get elected president so he can do the kind of goody-goody things that George Bush is doing. Let's see what Kayleen in Massachusetts has to say tonight. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello, my esteemed Mr. Brown. Yes, what's up? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, Monty, I choose door number three. Oh, okay. Very good point, very good point. Um, yes, foreign policy um, does not exist in this country, not like it should. Uh, foreign policy uh, is non-existent, basically, in, in our despotism. As well, I think what you mean is that foreign policy is never an issue, that everybody really accepts the basic premises, and so there's never any real debate about foreign right. policy as there should be. Right, right. Um, also, uh, I just as a, as a sideline, I wanted to say that I was uh, having a conversation on the phone with my father, who lives across the continent from me, um, about politics, and I mentioned uh, look up LP.org and also badnaric.org, uh, and uh, my father was saying, oh, well, what is that? I said, LP is Libertarian Party, and Michael Badnaric is the... Uh, candidate, uh, the Libertarian candidate for president. And he said, oh, I'm not interested in uh, Libertarianism. I'm voting uh, uh, the Constitutional Party. Well, my father, all of his adult life, has been a hardcore Republican. And I started to say, Dad, Dad, wait a minute, you don't understand. The Constitutional Party is not about the Constitution. The Libertarian Party is. But then he got another call, and we got interrupted. But really, the Libertarian Party, we are about the Constitution. Sure, but don't overlook the fact that the, the mere point that your father, a lifelong Republican, has decided to desert the Republican Party. That, that's true. That is, is true. It's really, that, really important news. Old. Yeah, it's important news, I think, that uh, it's indicative of what's going on. Jim Babka, who is the head of Downsize DC, mm -hmm. who will have a commercial on this show a little bit later, uh, said that he was in Washington last week and he went to a party where all the movers and shakers were showing up, and he was amazed at how many Republicans there yeah. were uh, venting their disgust at George Bush, and some of them even said that they're not going to vote for Bush. They probably won't vote for Kerry, and they may not vote for Badnerick, the Libertarian, but at least they have come to realize that there is something more than important than party in this world, and what it is is principle. It is what you originally joined the party for in the first place to try to further some point of view that the party obviously no longer is furthering. And so uh, there are a lot of good signs out there, and of course yeah. we hope the same thing will happen yeah. on the other side with the Democrats, that a lot of them will realize that the important thing is not to be George Bush, but to quit supporting the people that are making government bigger, no matter Absolutely. what party they're with. Absolutely. And one, one small point I wanted to make is that I uh, went on the computer on a graphics program, actually, uh, I don't want to say what program, because I don't want to promote anybody, but um, I made business card side uh, things uh, promoting Michael Badnard, president, just making a few points and showing a little picture of him in the corner, and we've been uh, just, uh, dispensing these to co-workers, Matthew and I have. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we've um, convinced a lot of people that libertarianism is the way to go. Well, that's good. I think that's the kind of thing that I would like to encourage everybody to do. There are a lot of things that we as individuals might want to be able to do but are not equipped to do, that we don't have the skills or the talent or whatever it is, but everybody can do something, and mm -hmm. what you have done is an indication of the kind of thing that an individual can do, whether it's uh, making up cards on mm -hmm. your computer, calling right. into a talk show, right. just writing letters to the editor, right. uh, just dropping hints to people at the office or whatever it may mm -hmm. be. In fact, in fact, um, one of the things that Matthew said to a coworker of his that he shared with me was, uh, are you a homeowner? He said to this coworker, and she said yes. And he said, well, what would happen if you didn't pay your property tax? Well, my home would get taken away. Oh, so therefore, you own your home, or does the government own your home? He said, you know, you're right. And he gave her a card, and she said, you know, I think I'll look into this guy. Good. Yeah. I'm, I was glad to see. I didn't know that we were going to have a commercial on this show for Michael Badnerick. As, I, I, as I listened to that. That was really interesting, yeah. And I, one thing I was very glad uh, to hear was they mentioned the word libertarian at least a half a dozen times mm -hmm. in that ad. I think that's very important yes. that 
we know we are not going to elect Michael Badnarik to the presidency. And the one thing I don't like about his ads is when he says, as president, I will, because yeah. that makes him sound a little delusional. Mm. But the fact that he mentions the word libertarian so mm -hmm. often is important because mm -hmm. the one thing we can be doing in the course of this campaign is to promoting, be promoting name recognition for yeah. the word libertarian and for the Libertarian Party so that more and more people come to realize that there is a school of thought that really wants to free you from the government, that yeah. really wants to give you your life back, that Absolutely. really wants to free you from these high taxes, from these intrusions, uh, and from the terror of the foreign policy. Absolutely. A, a, a paradigm shift. Yes. People need a paradigm shift. Yes. Thank you so much for calling, Kayleen. Thank you very much. You know, I was in the investment world for more years than I like to own up to, and I received dozens and dozens of newsletters every month, and I read a number of them just to keep up with what people were saying and filed the rest of them just so that when somebody said, I predicted such and such, I could go back and see that he never said any such thing. But since I've been out of the investment world, I still receive a number of newsletters that people send to me because they're not current with the times, I guess, but there really are only two that I would ever bother to read anymore, and only one of those do I make sure to read every single month and the one that I make sure to read every single month is called The Early Warning Report, and it's written, written by Richard Mayberry, who is also the author of a number of very, very interesting books, books on World War I, World War II, and the Thousand-Year War in the Middle East, plus a fascinating book that has been mentioned from time to time on this show, either by me or by a caller, which is Whatever Happened to Justice, which is perhaps the best explanation of law and what law ought to be and what it has deteriorated into in America, and all of these books are written in such plain, simple, straightforward language that they can be understood very easily by at least a teenager, if not somebody even younger than that, and yet are not patronizing or condescending as far as adults are concerned. And with that, I would like to introduce, for your benefit, Mr. Richard Mayberry, who we will be talking to from uh, California, and good evening, Richard. Hi, Harry. How are you doing? I am just so glad to have you on the show tonight. Well, you, thank you were on my show, I think, about a year ago when I was on another network, and we got a lot of very favorable response to it. Uh, your newsletter, uh, if I may say for the benefit of the listeners, is an investment newsletter, and it makes specific recommendations about certain kinds of stocks that ought to be able to profit from the mistakes of our government, and especially the mistakes that are made with regard to foreign policy. And as a result, you give a great deal of attention and background to what is going on in the world and what is bringing on the troubles that we have. And in your latest issue in September, you've made a number of very interesting points that I want to ask you about. Okay. Uh, let's begin with you mentioning that the rest of the world is bristling at having their neutrality taken away by the ridiculous statement by George Bush that you're either with us or against us, meaning that nobody's allowed to be neutral anymore. And you indicated that you believe that scores of governments secretly hope that the United States runs into trouble, gets mired down in Iraq and so forth, so that they can't uh, be around the world making more trouble for other countries. Do you want to uh, elaborate on that? Well, um, you said it pretty well. Oh, <laughs> oh there's more to it, I know. <laughs> well, um... I, I think the, uh, the key point is that George Bush um, made it part of uh, American foreign policy that, you know, as he said, you know, you're either with us or against us. Um, and and that, was, that turned out not to be just some rhetorical line in a speech. He repeated it over and over and over again, uh, driving it home. And I think it just um, it not only uh, angered a great number of other governments, but terrified some of them, too, because, as you say, it removed their neutrality. Um, they have to be in the war. They don't have a choice about staying out. And um, when you think of what it means, uh, you know, try to put yourself in someone else's shoes here. Um, if you're not on the side of the United States, which is the most powerful government in the history of the world, then you are an enemy of the United States. That's, I mean, you know, I'd be scared to death <laughs> if somebody said that to me, and that's what he's been saying. And so I think um, by uh, continually repeating that threat, um, and it is a threat to the rest of the world, um, there had to have been, who knows how many, you know, tens, maybe scores of other governments that decided um, that uh, these people have just gotten too big for their britches and we're going to have to do something about it because they're getting dangerous. And my guess is that um, throughout uh, the Mideast and, and probably parts of Europe, and I would include groups in Russia, not necessarily the Kremlin, but various groups in Russia, a lot of uh, these people have decided that they will secretly help the Iraqi guerrillas and the Afghan guerrillas simply for the purpose of keeping the U.S. government bogged down in that part of the world uh, as a kind of punishment and as a protection for them, because the more deeply the U.S. government is bogged down in the Islamic world, you know, the less it has any ability to hurt anybody else. So um, I think some of them are seeing it as insurance, as just a way of, 
of keeping the U.S. government from becoming more of a threat to them than it already is. Well, that makes a great deal of sense. And your words are in the newsletter, you said, Americans see the war as a problem, meaning the Iraqi war. Americans see the war as a problem. Much of the rest of the world sees it as a solution, <laughs> meaning that uh, as long as, as you said, as long as uh, America is bogged down in Iraq, that's the solution to this problem of you're either with us or against us. America can't be making any more mischief as long as we're tied down there. So they're glad to see that happen. I uh, began to think over this past week that maybe George Bush is going to pronounce a victory before the election and say that now that the Iraqi security forces have been built up to some figure like 50 or 75,000, I forget what it is, that Iraq is now able to take care of its own security and American troops are going to start coming home. And the first 20,000 or something will be coming home within the next two or three weeks or whatever, and then the rest of them will be coming over a period of time, maybe of the next six months or something. Uh, and this will be his October surprise to make us feel as though, uh, gee, everything's going to be all right. Do you, do you see any possibility of something like that? Well, there's certainly a possibility, and um, I thought, of, you know, I've, I've played around with the idea myself uh, for you know some time that, um, he, you know, he's, I don't, well, I don't know how intelligent the guy really is, but if he has any brains at all, he has to be desperately searching for a way to get out of there. Um, well, you know, it, when we talk about what George Bush is going to do or what George Bush thinks, what we really mean are the people involved there, in, including him, but also including Karl Rove and uh, Dick Cheney and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. Earlier, you mentioned that you thought that there were groups of people in Russia that were probably secretly supporting the Iraqi resistors. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, um, and, and I come at that from two different uh, viewpoints, or two different, uh, I don't know what you call it, outlooks. <laughs> sure. Um, the first one is, um, um, you know, everybody knows from their personal life that you don't ever hurt another person's pride. That that's, that's one of the worst things you can do, and he'll usually try to get revenge if you do it. So one of the first things you learn growing up is don't try to hurt somebody else's pride. But the U.S. government has is, is never learned that lesson, uh, and, and the lesson applies in geopolitics just like it does in our personal lives. And uh, I, I consider the U.S. government to be the most arrogant government since Rome. And after the fall of the Soviet Empire, um, it's just been a continual thing to brag about bringing down the Soviet Empire. And that hurts the pride of the Russians. And I have a very strong suspicion that they saw the invasion of Iraq as their chance to get even. And, and I'm not saying every Russian or everyone in the Kremlin, but I think there are groups in Russia that were just, you know, seething over this continual boasting about bringing down the Soviet Union, and this is their chance to get their revenge, and I think they've been getting it. If you will look at a map, you'll see that it would be very easy for, for instance, a uh, Russian oil company that has billions of dollars at its disposal to um, send uh, shiploads of uh, weapons and uh, ammunition south through the Caspian to northern Iran, and then with the uh, help of the Iranians, who also hate Washington, smuggle the, the stuff through Iran, through the mountains, along the border of Iraq, and then into Iraq. It would be a very natural, easy thing. That is an ancient smuggling route anyhow. And I, I very strongly suspect that is what is going on. A lot of the Iraqi weapons and ammunition are coming out of Russia. Um, and one reason that, that uh, gives me that idea is that, uh, that the Iraqis have somehow gotten hold of a very sophisticated new rocket-propelled grenade that has the ability to penetrate the armor on American tanks. Um, there was actually, uh, accidentally, a, a newsman that got a picture of that um, some months ago, a, a shot of one of these RPGs at an American tank and the American tank crew bailing out. Um, and that's a Russian design. Now, the second reason I think it's very likely this is going on is that the more chaos is created in the Persian Gulf, the higher the price of oil goes and the more money those Russian oil companies make. So you're, think, you're thinking that maybe uh, these, rather than being military people in the Russian government, but more likely uh, Russian corp new Russian corporations that are handling oil in Russia. Well, there's also a lot of Russian military people that are very angry at the U.S. government bragging about the fall of the Soviet Empire. So I would imagine there are just uh, coalitions of groups in Russia that are working together to do all they can to make this war as bad as possible for the U.S. Um, and, you know, the, you know, one thing that could be going on is some of these Russian military people may be selling the weapons to the oil company, knowing where the weapons are going. Uh, you never know. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, surmising here uh, to a great extent, but uh, I think the circumstantial evidence is pretty strong that, that some of that is going on. Uh, help, from, help from elements in Russia. Right. Finding its way into Iraq. Right. Yeah. And as you said earlier, there probably are others also, but as you're pointing out, it's particularly uh, likely for Russia simply because of the proximity and also because of the wealth that's created there by the oil crisis, by the rising price of oil. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about your newsletter is that you have a lot of maps in there. So we hear about all these places, but it's very difficult to put them together to realize what the uh, 
uh, relationship geographically is between Iraq and Russia and places like that, and I'm always glad to see those maps oh, because you. you don't even see them in newspapers, uh, and uh, very rarely do you ever see them on an Internet article or something of that sort. So we're all sort of just imagining these things. I remember when the whole business started with Afghanistan. I always thought Afghanistan was way over on the eastern end of Asia, and it was only when I finally saw some maps that I realized it was sitting right next to Iran. Mm -hmm. Let's find out what Chuck in California has to say. Good evening, Chuck. Hello, Harry and Mr. Mayberry. Hello. As the editor of a newsletter called Early Warnings, I'd like to see you devote an issue to something that President Bush said, I think, in October of last year. He said, we are not going to ever allow a Soviet Union-type government to ever arise again. In other words, imitating Rome even that much more. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear that. Uh, so that's in other words, right. he was saying nobody is ever going to be able to threaten us again. Yeah, that's right. That's the message that I got. So if an Argentina or a Brazil were to begin to rise, you know, because perhaps they adopted some libertarian philosophies, and they were to become a threat to the United States, we might go down there and nuke them. That's a good point. I, I had forgotten about that. I'm glad you brought that I up. I think uh, it was in early October, or October of last year. Yes, that's an interesting point. I'm glad you reminded me of that. Um, yeah, the... Uh, um, a, a, a kind of a subset of that threat is that, well, who decides who's a threat to the United States and who doesn't? Well, Washington does. So it's entirely up there. It, it, it would be King George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, that is a really scary thought. Um, it, and it goes along with the rest of the foreign policy. Right. You know, when they use words like preemptive strike, mm -hmm. and, you know, nobody nobody says a word, mm -hmm. you know, that, that the Constitution doesn't permit preemptive strike. It only permits defensive action, clearly delineated in the Declaration of Independence, also in the preamble to the Constitution. Yeah, but almost every president, at least yeah. in, since the 20th century, has taken the attitude and said publicly that we can't wait for them to strike New York or Los Angeles or something of that sort. Uh, we yeah. have to consider our defense perimeter to be, in effect, the whole world. Yeah, that if somebody, somebody could, it could even be a threat, we have to go and get them before they can get us. The phrase, the smoking gun, may be a mushroom cloud. Yeah, it's That's just right. it's one in many that have been uh, statements have been made by people like Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, and so on, and Ronald Reagan, of course, too. We got a question from Robert out there in cyberspace saying that you make several recommendations in your newsletter, and how do you feel about making these investment recommendations part of the stock portion of the 25% of the permanent portfolio that I recommend? And I have just got myself all tangled up in words there. I guess I better back up. Uh, I recommend a balanced portfolio of 25% in stocks and 25% each in bonds, gold, and cash. And he's wondering, do your defense stock recommendations that you make in the early warning report, uh, are they appropriate for the 25% stock portion of my portfolio? Um, I would doubt it. Um, when I make those kinds of recommendations, uh, they are strictly uh, speculative. Um, and uh, in my opinion, um, you know, pretty risky. Um, they are for people that are looking for speculation, and the permanent portfolio uh, strategy is to uh, achieve as much safety as possible. So, um, you know, as you know, Harry, when you were writing your newsletter, you had the permanent portfolio and then uh, the variable portfolio, which was the speculative part. And uh, most of the recommendations that I make um, for speculations would go into that variable portfolio, not the permanent portfolio. Well, one thing I like about your newsletter is that you do label your recommendations as speculations, and you also assign a risk level to them. And you don't say, oh, this is a very safe investment because it's, this is sure to come about and it's going to profit this stock. Rather, you point out that uh, this is the way you see it, but on a risk level of 1 to 5, with 1 being the safest, this is a 3 or a 4, you know, so forth and so on, so that people know what, what they are getting into when they do it. Uh, we have another question from Cyberspace. Dave in Phoenix asks, uh, that he, he says that he's heard some possibility of conflict between China and Taiwan. Do you have any thoughts about the likelihood or uh, the likelihood of there being an actual shooting war there? And also, would the U.S. get involved if there were? Um, yeah, there's, there's a significant possibility of that. And the, the more deeply the U.S. becomes mired in the, uh, in the Mideast, the more likely it is that the, the Chinese government will make its grab for Taiwan. And then it's very likely that the U.S. government will send in the Navy to get involved in that, too. Um, but... Um, Another point to keep in mind here, back, getting back to what I was saying earlier about pride, um, an awful lot of politics is about pride, and the, the Chinese government has, you know, is always stuck in their craw, to use an old saying, that, that uh, Taiwan is sitting out there, and they've wanted it. And um, I think that the day, you know, it's, it's nearly inevitable the day is going to come when they're going to make a grab, and the U.S. involvement uh, in the Middle East creates a great opportunity. So as time goes on, it becomes more and more likely, I would say. Well, you know, coming back to what I said earlier about the absence of maps so that most people don't know the relationship of one country to another, and I'm thankful that you do provide maps in your newsletter. Um, some people listening to the show may not realize that Taiwan is a very large island off the coast of China, and it has always been part of China, except for a few brief periods when Japan took it over. And I think 
it was Japan that named it Formosa. Somehow or other, those two names have stuck. But anyway, the point is that in 1949, when the communist, uh, China, the communist Chinese finally subdued Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist army on the mainland, the nationalists retreated to Taiwan and set up a separate government there, and the ch communist Chinese had the entire mainland then. But ever since then, in the 50-some years since then, the two have been pretty much uh, at each other's throats. There have even been... Uh, cannonballs lobbed back and forth uh, at, the, at each other and so on, and there's always been this talk about China wanting to reincorporate Taiwan into the uh, uh, mainland of China, and also the idea that the Chinese especially hate the idea that the Taiwanese will set up an independent government there and quit calling themselves the legitimate government of China and just simply say, we are the government of Taiwan. Uh, so anyway, as you say, uh, the United States might get involved, and, and it is a matter of pride. I like the fact that you bring that up. Uh, people tend to think of governments as being impartial, unemotional, uh, long-range thinking, and so forth, but the governments are just made up of politicians who have feelings like everybody else, and they don't like it when somebody calls their bluff. They don't like it when somebody uh, makes them look weak. They don't like this, and that, that's part of you know Bush's macho uh, appearance also. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think I made a comment in the newsletter uh, a few months ago that... Uh... Governments are like dogs. They're 5% intellect and 95% emotion. <laughs> I'm going to look at my dogs in a new light now. <laughs> I'm going to quit having those intellectual conversations with them because they obviously don't do any good. Um, I got an email from Pakal in Ohio at the beginning of the show, so it wasn't directed at you, but you'd be a good person to answer it. He said, could you please give your comments on the current hot topic of the connection between global, global terrorism and illegal drug traffickers? Um, and, of course, this has come up. They've even had uh, ads from the DEA saying that, you know, if you smoke marijuana, you're, you're uh, right there in the Al-Qaeda camp, you know, so maybe the U.S. government's going to bomb you. I don't know. But anyway, what, what about this connection between global uh, drug trafficking and terrorism? Well, yeah, there, there is one connection I can point to. Um, when the Taliban uh, were running Afghanistan, now, Afghanistan has long been uh, the, the chief supplier of heroin to the rest of the world. And when the Taliban were running it, they were very puritanical, and they pretty much shut down the uh, heroin trade altogether in Afghanistan. And then um, when George Bush decided to invade Afghanistan, he um, didn't want to commit um, enough American troops to do the job, so he went out and, and hired these drug gangs that uh, the Taliban had put out of business and, um, and labeled them freedom fighters. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And, uh, it's, the freedom uh, to put in your own body whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so these, uh, these hired freedom fighters <laughs> were sent against the Taliban, and um, they um, uh, were uh, helping the U.S. Uh, corner uh, al-Qaeda and some Taliban forces uh, in a section of the mountains there, and then uh, the Taliban, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, somebody, just bought off the drug lords, and the drug lords uh, let the, the Taliban and al-Qaeda escape. And that's why Osama bin Laden is still out there, because George Bush's hired drug lords <laughs> sold out to al-Qaeda. Yeah, you can't even trust the drug lords Isn't anymore. it awful? <laughs> and so um, now, of course, um, the Taliban has been um, somewhat eliminated, at least uh, removed from official power, and the place... You know, Afghanistan now is back in the hands of the drug lords who are now pumping out the heroin again. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll be right back, folks. We're talking with Richard Mayberry. Stay tuned. We have another segment to go with him and then a couple of segments on our own. Uh, you, we were talking earlier about Taiwan and China and the possibility of America getting involved. But, of course, China has nuclear weapons, which it's obvious Iraq doesn't and probably was obvious to a lot of people in the administration before the Iraqi war that there was no chance that Iraq was going to strike America with nuclear weapons. Do you think that that... Uh, really is a deterrent to the United States that uh, our government will not get involved in a scrape with somebody that does have nuclear weapons? It's uh, hard to say because you don't know how rational the politicians are going to be um, when the event happens. Um, I think it's uh, extremely important that Americans take a look at the Cuban Missile Crisis and what's known about that today. Um, McNamara um, has admitted that they were walking straight into a nuclear war and they only uh, averted it by luck. And he has said that clearly, that we only um, avoid a, nu a nuclear war by luck. Um, they had made several mistakes. They made assumptions about what the Russians would, wouldn't do, would or would not do. And it turned out those assumptions were wrong. And um, it, it was just it was just dumb luck that um, that Khrushchev picked up the phone and called and and basically said, you know, sorry, we're going to back out now. Uh, when he did, because if he had not done it at that moment, you know, the U.S. would have gotten nuked by uh, the missiles that were ready to go in in Cuba. So you don't really know um, what's going to happen. That's one of the awful things about governments uh, when they get as powerful as the U.S. government is. Um, these are human beings, and they make mistakes. Uh, and with that much power, when they make a mistake, it can be a really nasty one. So, right, and it's not going to affect just them. It's going to affect all the rest of us. That's right. And one, of the, one of the main points that the American founders kept making over and over again is that the people that run the government are human beings, and they make mistakes. So for that reason alone, you can't let them get very powerful. 
bind them down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Right. Was Jefferson's words. Yeah, how true. Uh, what do you think, then, the prospects are of the United States getting tough with Iran? Um, probably pretty, uh, pretty high probability there. Um, it's a stupid thing to do, so they'll probably do it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the point about Iran that nobody in the mainstream press ever points out is that Iran is Persia. And uh, the Persian Gulf is called the Persian Gulf because Persia owned it for thousands of years before the British and U.S. governments took it away from them. And so the, you know, the Iranians or Persians know that that's rightfully their property, and the oil is under it is rightfully their property, and they want it back. And they happen to loom over the Strait of Hormuz like this big cloud. I think the strait is only like 21 miles wide or something like that. And they that's, have that's the entrance to the Persian Gulf. Right, that's right. And they have missiles lined up all along, and I think the day is coming when they're going to get their hands on nuclear weapons and they're going to close the Strait of Hormuz. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows what the U.S. government is going to do, but it probably won't be smart. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the uh, the problem, of course, is, as you say, is that we tend to think of these people as being completely rational, and we try to anticipate what they'll do on the basis of what makes sense and what's right and what's wrong, and what makes sense to us is not necessarily what makes sense to them, and what seems to be in our interest is not necessarily in their interest. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see anything in looming if Bush is reelected that there are certain things that he would do once he's safely reelected? Yes, unfortunately. I'm writing an article on that right now. It'll be in the, the next newsletter. I think the thing to home in on is that it's not only uh, Washington's enemies that see this as a religious war, but Bush and his people see it as a religious war, too. Um, and Bush has made quite a few comments about uh, his belief that, that he's there uh, at God's will, uh, fighting a war for God and against uh, the forces of evil. And um, I think that if he wins the election, he will see this as confirmation that God is happy with the job he's doing and wants to see more of it. And um, now I want to point out very quickly you know, that analysis I've just given does not mean that I'm endorsing Kerry. Um, I think he's a whole other set of catastrophes. <laughs> yes, but, but Bush, I think, I think it's very likely, you know, um, that he'll see a electoral win as uh, God's uh, uh, patting him on the back and saying, go at it, boy. Yeah, and, you know, even without the religious component, uh, that's not unusual. Any time you elect somebody or re-elect somebody, uh, you may think he's the lesser of two evils, but he takes the re-election as an endorsement of everything he's done and uh, to step it up. You, you know, you elect Kerry, and he won't take it as, gee, I'm so glad I was running against Bush, whom, whom so many people hate. He'll take it as, oh, they want my national health care uh, program and all this other stuff. So uh, I think that what you're pointing out uh, is very important because it adds a further dimension to, to what exists already with almost all politicians, and that further dimension is the I'm performing God's will, and the re-election is confirmation of that. That's a, a very good point. Uh, we have about a minute left. Uh, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to get across in one minute? <laughs> Not with you, one minute. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I would say um, for, for the listeners' investments, um, I, I wrote an article in the last issue pointing out that, in my opinion, your plan, Harry, uh, the permanent portfolio plan, is the one that makes the most sense, and I've had my own money in it for, I don't know, maybe 20 years or something like that, and, and very happy with the results. And um, I continually recommend it because it's the surest route to safety that I know of. It's not perfect, but um, I really uh, recommend it to all of my subscribers because I don't know anything better. Well, I appreciate that. And I also appreciate very much the fact that you uh, could take the time tonight to be with us. Your comments are always interesting and original. And that's the nice part is that we hear from you things that we don't hear anywhere else. And we do have another half an hour to go, so don't go away, folks. This is Harry Brown. We'll be right back. Pierre out there in Canada says the China-Taiwan problem has broader global implications. Many Central American and Pacific countries recognize the Republic of China uh, being Taiwan instead of Beijing. Mainly this is for economic aid from Taiwan. Under the doctrine of preemptive warfare, might the People's Republic threaten countries like Costa Rica and Panama? Well, it's possible. I would not think they would do so because it would be very bad for their world image to be threatening little countries like that. And I realize that the United States does that, but China does not have that much of an interest in trying to stop Costa Rica and Panama from doing business with Taiwan. But then, as Richard pointed out in the last segment, you never know what these people are going to do. And Chinese politicians should not be assumed to be any more rational than American politicians. There's an interesting article that appeared in Intervention magazine about six months ago, but just came to my attention this past week, and there is a link to it on the Radio Links page on my website. A soldier who wanted to remain nameless because it is really against the law and against military law for any soldier still on active duty to speak out against the government, something I learned when I was in the Army myself. Not that I spoke out and got court-martialed, but they made it very clear to us in basic training that you are liable to be court-martialed if you speak out against the government during the time you're on active duty. An Intervention magazine interviewed this soldier, 
uh, but will not give his name. The soldier is a medic who has spent a good deal of time in Iraq since the war started over there. And it was a question and answer section, and let me just give you some of the things that were said. Question, do you think the American public is well informed about what is happening in Iraq? Answer, no, I really don't. I see young people on my medical table all the time, people who have lost their legs or arms or who have had other terrible injuries. No one back home sees any of that. I've been home for a month, and I haven't seen a casualty yet on television. I'm still waiting. Where are the casualties? It's as if they don't exist and that they don't happen. Question, what about Iraqi deaths and injuries? We don't care about Iraqi deaths. It's something that doesn't even count. The hospital was told not to keep count. The Iraqi infrastructure does not keep an account of the deaths anymore. Question, why? Answer, the American government told them not to. We do always keep a list of the Americans injured and the number that die, but here in America you don't see anything about these soldiers coming back. You don't read anything about the funerals. It's like a secret, like these people didn't exist. Question, was it like this in previous wars? No. What about, brought about the change? Answer, from what I gather, it used to be that the president would go out to the area to meet the deceased soldiers coming in. They would drape the caskets, and they would actually watch and give a moment of silence as the coffin came by. The Bush administration felt that was too much for Americans to handle, so they secured that part of the ceremony so that no one knows when that fallen soldier comes home. It's an injustice to the military because you give your life to the country, and the country should give something back to you. Even just a moment of silence. Every day that someone dies, the flag should be lowered to half staff, not just because a politician died. And, and if I may interject, this goes along with what I've said before, is that there is no recognition in any of the official statements that people are dying. Rumsfeld says we think it's worth the cost. The cost to whom? What cost? Are you talking about the fact that some family doesn't have their father anymore and they should feel that it is worth the cost in order to do well, whatever it is we're supposedly doing in Iraq, which nobody seems to know anymore because obviously the Iraqis are not liberated. Obviously the Iraqis were no threat to us. So these families are supposed to feel that, yes, it's all right, that somebody died long, long before his time. There is no recognition of death, and they want to keep the word death and dying and any pictures of it from the American people. And uh, another question in the interview, are the men and women in the U.S. military in Iraq sufficiently trained before going over there? Answer, no. I am extremely concerned about the major shift that is taking place right now between, between now and June, where there's going to be a much higher percentage of the troops being reserves rather than full-time active duty military. And he's talking about last June because this was uh, published in March. The difference is that the active duty go through far more training than the reserves. Up to now, we've had a mix of about 20% reserves and 80% active duty. With the change that's going on now, they're rotating out tens of thousands of active duty troops and replacing a lot of them with reserves. We've heard that it could be 80% reserves and 20% active duty, or it might be 50-50. But the main point is nothing like this has ever been tried before, and these reserves are being sent into a war zone. Many of them are people who would be fine driving a truck or working on a base in some support capacity, but they're going to be out there on the streets with M16 rifles. It took me a long time to become skilled with my M16. You have to learn about all sorts of things. It takes time to get it right. There's one more thing from this intervention article that I want to cover. Uh, the interviewer asked, what did you think about President Bush's Thanksgiving visit to Iraq? Answer, I was there when President Bush came to the Baghdad airport. The day before, you had to fill out a questionnaire and answer questions that would determine whether they would allow you in the room with the president. What was on the questionnaire? Do you support the president? Really? Yes. Members of the military were asked whether they support the president politically? Yes. And if the answer was not a gung-ho, A100% yes, then you were not allowed into the cafeteria. You were not allowed to eat the Thanksgiving meal that day. You had an MRE. What's an MRE? Meals ready to eat. But we call them meals refused by Ethiopians. <laughs> and having been in the Army once, I know what they're talking about. Question about this questionnaire, it raises a serious question about whether military personnel or civil servants, for that matter, should ever be asked questions by their supervisors about their political beliefs. It also raises the whole question of freedom of speech, in particular the circumstances under which members of the military have freedom of speech. Answer, there is none. If you are spouting good things about the president, you are allowed to speak. If you are saying anything negative, you are not allowed to speak. Well, I urge you to go to my website, to the Radio Links page, and click on the link to this uh, article because there are a lot of other interesting things in there about the suicides over there that are not reported and so on. But now, let's get back to the phone talk with Stu in Texas. Good evening, Stu. Hi, Harry. Hello there. You know, uh, first of all, I have to thank you for saving my life back in the early 70s. Well, uh, what was, was it? Did I jump into a pool and keep you from drowning? Or what? <laughs> no, you never knew about it, but... Uh, I, I was on the verge of committing suicide back then, and some friend of mine uh, gave me your book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, and that brought me out of my, my stupor. My heavens, I certainly 
and amazed. I appreciate your telling me about that. And as a result, I followed your advice, and I stayed out of uh, out of the government's way for many, many years until I saw you on C-SPAN running for president. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a traitor. <laughs> and I said, what in the world has been happening? People are listening to us now, huh? Yeah. And I jumped back into the fray trying to get you into the debate. Of course, I failed, but... Yeah, I've been uh, wanting to talk to you about that. Uh, <laughs> you didn't get the end of the debate. Yeah, I didn't do such a good job. <laughs> right. It's really a shame that, that we can't have, a, have uh, you in the debate with George Bush and John Kerry show what idiots they are. But, um, you know, I think that what we libertarians need to do to further the libertarian cause is each one of us pick a particular problem that is caused by government and then propose a libertarian solution and implement it and show that it can be solved by getting the government out of the way. And I'm, I'm trying to do that down here in El Paso. I don't know if you've read the recent survey. El Paso has been named one of the most illiterate cities in the entire nation. Well, and it's got a lot of competition, but I no, I hadn't, <laughs> hadn't heard that uh, that was the case. And uh, we're the drunkest. And, drunkest? And, and yeah, <laughs> and we've got we've got uh, about forty percent of the population on welfare. So it's it, it, it's kind of a cesspool uh, of, of government uh, problems. But uh, what, so what, what is I'm your, working on? Yeah, what's your project then? Well, my project is here in the state of Texas. Of course, on the Texas state constitution, there is a provision that mandates that the taxpayers support the government schools or I would prefer to call them government taxpayer-funded welfare schools, mm -hmm. okay? Sure. And uh, so I uh, am trying to get the people to support a constitutional amendment to the Texas State Constitution that would go somewhat along the lines of your proposed solution to Social Security, sell all the assets, put the, the money in a trust fund, income from that goes towards needy kids' uh, scholarship, and then... Uh, separate the school and state completely, uh, and, and then from then on, the parents are freed from the uh, property taxes, the majority of which go towards supporting the schools down here. And I found out in reading the Texas State Constitution uh, something very interesting. Of course, it was a very boring read. It's over 200 pages, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that there are actually amendments on the Constitution that only... Uh, only impact uh, single communities. So I could get this for just El Paso, and well, then... That's good, and then make an example for right. the rest of, of the state. Right. That's good. Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, it sounds good. We have to take a break. Um, there are two articles. Uh, go to my homepage, harrybrown.org, and uh, very early down on the page, there are links to two articles of mine, Free the Schools and Education for Everyone, showing how poor children would get educated in a totally free market education system. And right now, let's take a final phone call from David in Texas. Are you with us, David? I'm sorry that we've had to squeeze you in on this last short segment. Is there something you can tell us in a minute? Uh, well, just a, well, uh, maybe just quickly. I like listening to your show because I learned things. And a couple of weeks ago, I learned you have an opinion about a topic that I didn't even know was a topic. What's that? Uh, that is the basis for forming libertarian arguments. Uh, as far as I can tell from your comments, there are three ways. One is the natural law basis. Another is a constitutional basis. And the third, I think, is which is the one you prefer, is what works and what doesn't work. And, and appealing to self-interest is the way that I, I really like to go. And one of the, the subsets of that is the fact that government doesn't work, so you're not going to get what you think you're going to get from the government, but always talking in terms of the difference that getting rid of government in this area or that area could make on your life the person you're talking to. I think I'd like to call you next week maybe and have a longer conversation. You've, you've that, would, that, that would be a good idea because I don't, certainly don't want to have to cut you short, but the network's not going to let me uh, run over <laughs> into the next hour. Okay, well, I'll, I'll uh, call back next week then. Okay, David, thank you very much. It sounds like it would be an interesting discussion. And I want to, again, invite you to go to my website, harrybrown.org. There are, of course, uh, articles there on all sorts of things. There's a topical index that you can look at so that you can look up uh, articles on foreign policy or on Social Security or whatever it may be. I also started a few weeks ago to keep a journal on the website, which you can get too easily from the home page, and two or three or four days a week I enter random thoughts, things that uh, don't warrant an entire article or the, the structured format of an entire article, and there are some interesting things on there. Well, I think they're interesting. They're, let's say they're interesting subjects you can decide for yourself whether the tack I take on them is interesting. But there are all, are all sorts of things there, so that if you like these subjects, uh, I invite you to go there and to get some more ideas that you may agree with or may not agree with. But either way you look at it, one thing that's important is that we're going to be back here again next Saturday night at the same time, and I hope you will be too, because I'm sure we'll get into a lot more interesting things. Until then, I want to urge you to have a good week and take care of yourself this week. Don't worry so much about the world, but do things where you can really make a difference. This is Harry Brown. Thanks again for being here. I'll talk to you next week.